Dr. Gloria Polo was an orthodontist living in Colombia when she was struck by lightning and had a near-death experience in which she was judged by Jesus and condemned for mortal sin. Fortunately, a very pious, humble farmer who saw a picture of her in the newspaper prayed for her soul and Jesus granted her a second chance with a mission to repeat what she witnessed not only a thousand times but a thousand times a thousand and that when she comes back before Jesus to be judged again she will be judged with greater severity due to her second chance and all that she saw while over there sharing this beautiful gift of the Lord gave me Señor me dio 11 years ago ya hace 11 años y de paso aprovecho para and I also want to thank the priest Padre who had the kindness to let us use the church este this gift sí, occurred on May 5th 1995 at the National University in Bogota my 23 year old nephew who was an odontologist or dentist and my husband who was accompanying us and myself who am a dentist as well my nephew and I were making a specialization we had to go and pick up some books at the National University, but it started raining heavily. 
por eso estaba lloviendo muy fuerte. Cuando íbamos de camino a la facultad... As we were making our, our way to the faculty, we were struck by lightning. You have no idea how... My nephew was me without breast. He took the flesh out of my stomach and out of my womb. Of all my body, the legs were the ones who got burned the most. The lightning bolt also burned my liver, my lungs, and my kidneys. They were all affected by the burn. I was using an IUD for Plant Parenthood intraurine device. The IUD charred the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. And I was also in cardiac arrest as well as my nephew. The paramedics took some time to give us CPR because there was a lot of water there and they had to wait until we stopped passing electricity so that they could pick us up. When they finally gave us CPR, my nephew died already. I was taken to the hospital. And in the hospital, the doctors took me into the operating room and they started doing surgery on me. In the operating room, I had a second cardiac arrest. When I went into cardiac arrest, the doctors gathered my family and they told them that I was extremely burned and that there was no possibility for me to survive because the worst burns were the ones that I had internally which were my internal organs and that I could die in any minute. So that's what the doctors told my family and they advised my family not to connect me to an intensive care unit because if they did that, they would just prolong my suffering. But my family and my sister who was a doctor, they all said no. And my sister, the doctor, said, no, you are not God, and I'll take my sister to a different hospital, to a hospital for intensive care. They took me to a hospital for intensive care. And do you know what? I thank God that I was in coma, because I'll tell you something, I defended euthanasia. If I would have been conscious and they would have asked me, I would have said to let me die with dignity. And I would have ended up in hell. But thank God that my family was the one who decided for me. So they took me to another hospital in Bogota. And I was in coma for three days. I was in a serious condition. And just when I was about to die, because my kidneys were not working, they were not filtering, and thus I was dying. And on the third day, the Lord brought me back. To the astonishment of all the doctors and all the people, the Lord brought me back. He brought me back, and I was taken again back to the first hospital. Every day they would do very painful treatments and procedures. They would scrape off my dead flesh. And a month and a half later, the doctors told me, 
Listen, Gloria, we've done everything we could, but your legs are not responding. We're going to have to amputate. Can you imagine? I worked all my life to take care of my body. I idolized my body and I spent so much money taking care of it. I would spend three to four hours doing aerobics every day. I would go in between anorexias, bulimias, and drugs to lose weight, different medicines, and I was very proud of my breasts. And the breasts, which were the part of my body that I was more prideful about, they were entirely charred and without flesh. When they told me that they were going to cut off my, my legs because they were not responding, I was translated from the fifth floor to the seventh floor. I saw a lady and they had cut off one of her legs and they were going to cut it a little bit more. I only had two values in life. I thought people could only be happy on earth if they had a lot of money, a lot of money and studying a lot. I thought that was the only thing that was worth it in a human being. When I could not pass any saliva or swallow because of my burns, when it burned, when I breathed, and when I realized that they are going to cut up both of my legs, I thought, what's the money for? Not even all the entire money in the whole world can buy you a pair of legs. And I never thanked the Lord for having my legs because everything was about me. It was about my legs and it was about my breasts and it was about all me. At that moment, I thanked the Lord for my legs and I asked Him, Please, Lord, do not cut them off. Please, let me keep them. Even if I can barely walk, do not cut them up. Let me keep them. So the Lord gave me my legs. So all of a sudden, my legs started receiving circulation again because they were black. They were extremely dark, light raisins. And they had a lot of holes, but blood started circulating in them. And here they are. The only thing that remains in me is that I have difficulty when I walk. So now I have to use rubber shoes, pretty much tennis shoes. Because if I use any other kind of shoes, I get electricity. That's the only thing. But other than that, I'm here. And you know one thing, brothers and sisters? Every time I give one step like this, I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for that beautiful gift, His love that I can walk. Everything is a gift, everything. But I never saw it as a gift until they told me that they were going to cut off my legs. And to wrap it up with all the physical part, because it was a very long process. It was a very long process of healing and medical treatments. I was in the hospital for a month and a half, and after that time, they finally released me. I left the hospital without breast. I had two holes on my breast and on my ribs. After a year and a half, the Lord restored my breast without any medical intervention. He was the one who filled them up. He formed my breasts again. The scars, the scar that was there, came out. So I had breasts again. And the part where I didn't have any flesh, and there was flesh again on the side of the ribs. This part was the one that was the most difficult to fill because there was a big hole, and the Lord filled it up after a year and a half. You 
And do you know why so many miracles and so much love? Because even though my ovaries were entirely burned and they told me that I was never going to have any children again, the Lord gave me a beautiful daughter. She is nine years old and her name is Maria Jose. Such a beautiful and great gift. But the most beautiful thing about all this, and I tell you this, with so much shame, when I was struck by lightning, at that very moment, my life was in chaos due to so many things that were happening and due to all the knowledge that I acquired during my whole life, that I ended up not believing in God when the lightning bolt struck me. I thought that a human being, when the person died, it was the end of it. Irrational animal that develops its intellect to its fullness. And that's it. There's nothing else. At that time, I was studying with a lot of scientists who were atheists. And I would allow myself to be blown as a feather on the wind. So when I was with the atheist, my doctrine was atheism. Therefore, the most beautiful thing when I was struck by lightning, and I want to ask you to forgive me, because I have no words to describe that beautiful gift. When the lightning bolt struck me, I never stopped. I saw my body lying there, burned, but I was enveloped by an immense light in so much love, in so much peace, in an infinite love, in an eternal joy. It is something that it cannot be described. I started to go up and I saw an immense light. And at that moment, I am entirely free of time and free of space. I'm in that eternal fullness, in that eternal love that nobody can describe in such a big joy that I never experienced that kind of thing in my whole life. Nor peace, nor the kind of love that I experienced. So immense. So as I started to go up and I started getting closer to that light, I saw all the people in an instant. I hugged them all and I wanted all of them to feel the love that I felt and nobody felt me. Only my oldest daughter, who was nine years old back then, she was the only one who felt when I hugged her. As I started going up, it was such a beautiful moment. I saw my parents, I saw my grandparents. Everybody was there. It was a beautiful moment of communion and I kept going up and as I kept going up, I saw that beautiful light. And in that light, there was an opening. When I looked at the opening, I realized at that moment, because at that moment, there was this spiritual wisdom over me, a knowledge that was above my mental process. It was beating because he was alive. Then I saw at that moment, that that living light that was beating of love was the heart of Jesus. It is the heart of Jesus. Him. Right there. He had an opening on his side. And that opening was a door. It was a wound. And as I get closer to there, beyond the opening, I saw a lake. I just can't describe it, the beauty and the greatness. Our words are so poor, and I just don't have the words to describe it. I wanted to go in, but at that moment I heard the voice of my husband, who was screaming at me, Gloria, please do not go. Come back. Don't be such a coward. The children, Gloria. At that moment I was sent back. I did not have liberty and I did not have free will. 
If I had free will, I would have fought to stay. But that would have never been possible because the only people who go inside are the ones who are in the grace of God. And I was by no means in the grace of God. When I was sent back and I entered my body, my body went into seizure. And it was very painful to go into my body. And I was extremely burned. And there was so much pain in my, my entire body. And I experienced a lot of pain due to my vanity. So when I had my second cardiac arrest, I had a different experience in the operating room because I saw how from the walls of the operating room a lot of people came out and they had so much hate in their eyes. They had evil eyes. At first I tried to reason what was happening in a human way so I said to myself, I'm just hallucinating because I don't have enough oxygen. These idiots have me hypoxia, which means low oxygen. And at that moment, this spiritual wisdom came over me again. And I had this knowledge above my mental process. And I realized that it was all the sins that I committed since I was 13 years old up to the last moment of my life. Why since I was 13 years old? Well, because I died when I was 13 years old. People think that dying means when you are buried. But no, that's not how it is. I died when I was 13 years old because when I was 13 years old I abandoned a life of faith so I left the hands of God I left the hands of my mom and I started living according to what the world says that a happy young person is but I was not a happy person since I was 13 years old and up so I'm going to share with you about my death, the death I had when I was 13 years old. And that has nothing to do with the accident. When I was 13 years old, I was a child from a small town. I was very happy until I was 13. My mother was an adorer of the Blessed Sacrament. She was a very poor woman, but she had an incredible love towards the Blessed Sacrament. She was a holy woman. And when I was in my town, I loved God dearly. I loved the Blessed Virgin Mary. I loved to go to Mass. I loved to visit the sick and to visit the homeless people. My family was a poor family. But we were never short in food to give someone poorer than us some food. But when I moved to Bogota and I got to meet these friends, I formed part of a group of rebel girls. Supposedly they were very smart, and I say this in quotation marks. Supposedly they knew everything. And in less than three months, less than three months, they had money and they bought a lot of things with the money. And in the three months, I was thinking like them because they said it was very modern and very cool. And I wanted to think like them. So to me, it was very normal to see my friends going to bed with their boyfriends. I started seeing like something normal that they had abortions. I came to find out what an abortion was. I saw everything that they practice and I started seeing everything that they do and I became a photocopy of them. How sad. So when I was 13 years old, I went with a witch so that they can tell me my fortune with the cards. I fell into divination, horoscopes, the zodiac and all those kinds of things. 
and I started reading books of meditation, of mental power, when I was 13 years old. So I died when I was 13 years old, and one sin brings another sin. I rebelled against my mom. She became my enemy because she would talk to me about God and she would talk to me about the virginity of women. But my friends spoke to me everything that was opposite to that. So when I was 13 years old, I started listening to the music, to rock and roll music. And I wanted to go with my friends, but my mother wouldn't allow me. So my mom became tedious to me. And when I was there, free of the hand of God, full of sin, I started hating the church. I became anti-clerical, just like my friends, because I was a copy of them. I would speak bad about priests, so I did not have to go to confession, because it's easier for us to look at the sin of others than to look at our sins. So I did not confess anymore, and that was the most terrible thing that happened in my life. I never went to confession again. I did not live a life sacramentally, and that's the reason why the sins came out since I was 13 years old. When I realized that sin was alive, and that sin has a pay, and the payment was me, all the rich and all the poor people doesn't matter. At that moment of the encounter, all your richness, all your studies, all your intelligence, everything is left behind. None of that is worth anything. The only thing that's worthy is reality. And the reality is that if you live without God, the sins will come and get you. I started running with horror that I do not know at what time. I passed the wall of the operating room. As I passed the wall of the operating room, I entered some sort of living cells. At the beginning, those cells had a lot of light and you could feel peace, a lot of peace and a lot of love. And I saw many people in those living cells. It was like a labyrinth. I don't know how to explain it. I do not know what name to give it. And all those people were dressed like the sun. Their garments were like the sun, like an immense light. And I realized that those garments that looked like the sun, they were all those Eucharistic people who receive our Lord Jesus every day in the Eucharist. So they were dressed like the Lamb of God. So an immense light shone from their garments. They were the image of Christ because every time they received the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus would dress them with his flesh and his blood. So they were dressed with the Lamb of God. They were all beautiful. But I could not stay there because I kept going down. As I kept going down, I saw my mother who was dressed like the sun. She looked like a sun. And I realized that my mom was not a crazy woman. I used to say, my mother is a crazy woman. Why would I say that? Because she was a poor person and she didn't have any studies. And because she had a husband who was a drunkard and who was an adulterer, my father. And she was very meek and my father was a macho man. Nonetheless, she would be smiling. She was always happy. And I would say, how can a woman be happy with such a miserable life? And my mother would tell me, daughter, I am very happy because I'm in love with Jesus. I feel a fire in my heart and I love him, I love him, I love him. That's why I do not need anyone to make me happy. Because I want to make people happy. And I want the entire world to be saved. And I want all the people to feel the love that I have in my heart. So I would say, I have a crazy mother. And I would be ashamed that people would find out that she was my mom. But I realized that my mom was not a crazy woman. She fell in love with Christ and he dressed her. So I kept going down because I have no will. I wanted to go back, but I wasn't able to. And I kept going down. As I kept going down, it smelled horribly. And the people looked different. They were dark. People were deformed. They were disfigured. 
and I realized with a lot of pain that those people are suffering. And I also realized something that was very terrible. For the first time I looked inside of me and I see that sin is a living creature. People may say I'm a liar and I'm a thief. I'm a gossiper. I drink and they think that stays outside. No, it doesn't. Sin is a living creature and it comes and it helps you. If you could only see how horrible my soul was, it was very frightening. 22 years without confession, I would live according to my principles. And those sins were screaming and laughing and moving inside of me. I was screaming, but I kept going down. And as I kept going down farther more, I saw these swamps and there were people inside those swamps. I looked at them in those swamps. They were screaming and they were so ashamed. And I see my father and when I saw my father, I screamed at him and I said, Daddy, what are you doing here? My father had already died many years ago. And he said to me, my daughter, adult, Where sin loses its mask. Your children because that was the same kind of home that we had. My father would cry every time he would see one of my brothers go to bed with another woman. So when I saw my father cry, I could not do anything and I kept going down. And my father would say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for those 38 years of prayer from that holy woman that you gave me as a wife. Thanks to those 38 years of prayer, I was saved. However, I kept going down. I got to a flat plain and there was a living hatred and a big hole or mouth opens and I go inside, head down in that living hatred. As I started going down there, I started screaming. I was screaming like crazy. They grabbed my feet and immediately there were a lot of creatures that came over me. It was a living hatred. It was a living darkness. They would burn me. They would burn and there was no fire. The darkness was burning me and I felt my sins inside of me and they were burning me. They were burning me as well. And I started screaming, souls of purgatory, take me out of here. When I screamed to the souls of purgatory, I started hearing the grinding of their teeth. They were crying and they were moaning. Thousands and thousands of people who were in that pit. When I saw them, I felt so much pain. And I realized that there were a lot of people who committed suicide. There were so many young people and I felt so much pain. So I screamed, please take me out of here. I never stole, I never killed. I would do charity to the homeless. I would take out crowns for free to all the needy people. And I would scream desperately, I am Catholic, take me out of here. When I screamed that I'm a Catholic, I saw a light and I saw some stairs. And in those stairs, I saw my parents. My father was on the first step, and three steps above my father was my mother. She was with a lot of light. When I saw them both, I screamed, I screamed. Daddy, mommy, take me out of here. When they looked at me at, in that pit, you should have seen 
the pain that they had in their eyes. My father started crying and he said, no, Lord, my daughter, not my daughter. At that moment, I realized that they could not take me out. And I understood that all the parents, all, we're going to have to respond to the Lord about the kind of home that we gave to our children. All parents will give account to God to the kind of things that they put in the hearts of their children. God gives the parents a gift to imprint in the souls of their children for all eternity. But what happens with the parents who have no God? What can they imprint in their children? So my father was crying because a drunkard cannot tell his children not to be drunkards. A thief cannot tell his children to be honest. A womanizer cannot tell his children to be transparent and to be faithful. So my father was crying a lot. So at that moment when I saw the pain in my parents who are responding to God about me and the reason why they didn't put any values in me, why they didn't form me for all eternity, at that moment I screamed again and I said, take me out of here, I am Catholic, there's no reason for me to be here, I should not be here. So when I screamed again that I'm a Catholic, I heard a beautiful voice, so sweet, so sweet, that it fills everything with peace. Everything is filled with love. And that voice tells me, very well, if you are a Catholic, tell me the commandments of the law of God. Checkmate. I had no idea. I only knew the first commandment because my mother would used to talk about the first commandment. So I would respond, to love God above all things and your neighbor as yourself and that voice tells me very well and have you loved him and I screamed yes I have I have I have when he tells me no all the masks that I had as a saint they all fell down to the floor. All my falseness comes out and my heart was open, meaning the intention of my heart. Everything comes out to the light. And he says to me, no, you have not loved your Lord above all things. You made a God according to your likeness. You would only remember your Lord in the time of need and in the time of suffering because you had a God. Your God was the money. When he said to me that my God was the money, I yelled out, but what money if I left so many debts on earth? I was in bankrupt and I had so many debts. I could only speak up to that moment because at that very moment, the Lord opened my book of life. How great is the Lord, how much love He has for us. He has a book for each one of us with all of our life. The book of life is the most beautiful thing, so beautiful. I saw my life since the beginning. Do you know how? I saw how the sperm got close to the egg of my mom and they were still not getting in contact with each other and there was a big explosion of light and my mother's womb and it lit my mother's womb and a beautiful sun was formed it was my soul my soul was a light it was formed in the fullness of maturity in the fullness of knowledge in the fullness communion with God I talk to God a creature in the time of conception is already speaking with God if you watch a little baby the baby smiles and laughs alone and is so joyful alone and it laughs all of a sudden 
because he is enjoying God. I could see how God spoke to me. God would enjoy with me. Up to the age of three years old, he was so close to me. But after the three years of age, the Lord hid himself as a fire inside my heart. In that way, he respected my free will to assume whether I wanted to love God or not to love Him. At that moment, my father and my mother were called to watch over the talents that God gave me and to watch over the love of God in my heart. When I was little, my soul was like this glass of water. It was full with the love of God. When I was a child, they would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, I want to be a doctor. And my dad would say, to have money? And I would respond, no, because I want to help the poor. But when I started to commit sin in this clear water, something like mud entered. Every living sin and a little sin opened the door to a bigger sin. I became a liar, I became a lazy person, a gossiper, envious, complicated, and I kept filling up myself with sin. My soul that was white started getting darker. And I'm telling you that this way because it is much, much worse than that. How my soul kept getting filthy. The more I filled up myself with sin, the more water of love I started losing. I didn't love God. I didn't love the people. I only thought about myself. I only thought about my happiness. I only thought about my selfishness. I only thought about me. Poor me, I do not have money. Poor me, I have such bad luck. How much I suffer. I did not care anymore about the suffering of other people. It was very sad, as the Lord showed me in the Book of Life, how I started to fill up myself with so much sin and how I started getting confused and how I was blinded by sin at the age of 13 and how the enemy, when he blinded me with sin, I started looking at evil as something good. I saw sin as something good and I started to defend it. So I became deaf. And I kept going on the way where I saw what abortion was when my friends had an abortion. And my friends made me feel bad because I was a virgin. And they would say to me, you are such an idiot. How come you do not enjoy life? What's wrong with you? We are all fine. But you know what? When my friends had that experience with abortion, they would use very well all the methods for Planned Parenthood. They said to me that their moms were very modern. Their moms were the kind of modern moms. So they would take them to the gynecologist as soon as they would physically develop. And they would teach them how to take the pill. In my country, nobody knew what a contraceptive was. So the mothers would bring them from the USA. So I learned what a contraceptive was from a young age. When I was 16 years old, all my wishes died because when I was 16 years old, I ended up in depression. God showed me in the Book of Life how the enemy stole and how he blinded me. So when I was 16 years old, I was ready to offer to him my first sacrifice. And that human sacrifice that he showed me Lord is committing the most abominable thing 
the worst of all sins, which is one of the sins that I committed, and that's called abortion. Thanks to the prayer of my mom, when my friends had an abortion, they were so depressed, but they denied it. They said that it didn't hurt them and that it was nothing. So they started looking for their happiness in the drugs. They would smoke pot, they would take LSD, and other kind of drugs, and they would degrade more every day. They would hear music, they would hear rock, they would go to trips, they would go to bed with one guy and another one, they would consume more drugs, more hallucinogenics, and they became a vicious group in which they were degrading more. And prayer of my mother, the Lord showed me that because of and they offer them to me. I would say to them, no, I do not have money to buy those expensive things. But they would say, don't worry, we'll give it to you. We've given everything to you all the time. But I was never able to do it. And why? Because of the prayer of my mother. Can you imagine when I was 13 years old? Being a poor person, and if I had become a drug addict, where would I end up now? But I did not end up because many of my friends died. Many of them died because of overdose. However, when I was 16 years old, I had so much peer pressure from my friends and from other people. So when I was 16 years old, I met this person, my only boyfriend and I fell in love with him. So my friends would tell me that it was time. But I would tell them that I would not go to bed with anyone unless I fell in love with someone. So when I had a boyfriend, I didn't want them to find out. But one day my boyfriend went to pick me up at the college and they found out. So my time was over. So it was time. So they started teaching me Planned Parenthood, how to planify. They showed me a lot of pills and they gave me two condoms and they said to me that they would make me invincible and that nothing was going to happen. So when I was 16 years old, I had my first premarital sexual relation. And with a lot of sadness, I realized that in the coming month, I did not have a period. And I was so scared. I was extremely scared. So I went to tell my friends, my period is late. So they said to me, it's nothing. It's because it's the first time for you, so nothing's going to happen. And on the second month, I still did not have a period. And my body changed. My breast started changing. And I realized that inside of me, there's a life. And I was so scared. I was in a lot of panic. I thought, oh my God, I'm pregnant. What am I gonna do? But my friend said to me, take it easy. It's nothing, Gloria. That gynecologist that has performed all the abortions in all of us is really good. So we're gonna go talk to him so that he gives you a discount because you do not have money. But nothing's gonna happen. I wasn't able to sleep anymore, brothers and sisters. Since I was 16 years old, I was never able to sleep again. I was in so much anguish, and I was think, what am I going to do? My reasoning was clouded, everything was clouded. And I would think, this is horrible. Who can say that this is good? This is horrible. It's a nightmare. I was so anguished, so I kept silent, hoping that I was not pregnant, but I knew I was pregnant. So on the third month, 
On the third month of pregnancy, I was so scared. My baby started moving in my womb, and I started feeling so much tenderness, and I started loving that baby. And I was not able to tell my boyfriend that I was pregnant. But on the fourth month, he started moving much more, and I started showing that as well in my clothing. So that's when I told my boyfriend. And I was hoping that he would tell me, do not worry, Gloria, it doesn't matter. We're going to get married and we're going to be successful. I already had three to four months without sleeping. Submerging a lot of anguish. But when he says to me, Gloria, how can you be pregnant? If we are taking care of ourselves, that's impossible. And it was just one time, it's impossible that you are pregnant. But I said to him, yes, but I'm pregnant. The baby is moving. And I said to him, do you want to feel him? And I put his hand over me and the baby moved. He removed his hand and he was scared. So he said, no, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. You're just a 16 year old girl. I have not finished my studies. We are studying. I'm just a 16 year old guy. There's nothing we can do. We must have an abortion. When he said that to me, I felt that the entire world trembled. I felt so much pain, but I was a coward. I didn't know what to do. I was so scared and I cried and I said, no, no, no. And he would say to me, yes, Gloria, we cannot ruin our lives. You know what I complain about? I complain that I was always my entire life a coward because I was never able to fight for the life of that child. We went to the gynecologist and he said, oh, it's nothing, because he saw me crying and crying. And he told us how much it would cost. He gave us the abortion half price. Do you want to know how much the life of my child cost? It costs what a cow costs. I know this because my husband had a state and one day he sold a cow and the price of the cow was the price that I paid for the abortion. When I went inside the abortion room, I was crying and crying and I could not stop crying. It is very painful, extremely painful. I don't understand why people say that abortion is okay. It's not okay. Why do we say that? When the soul hurts, because after I had the abortion, I came out dead. I started hating myself. I started hating life. I lost my feelings. I lost peace. I did not have any more good dreams ever again. All happiness died. And do you want to know what the Lord showed me? In the book of life you see things the way God sees them. Do you know what the Lord showed me? He showed me how my child was taken to the slaughter, to the table of sacrifice. The table of sacrifice was the bed where I had the abortion. And he showed me how a doctor to whom God gives the gift to defend life and to fight for life. He showed me how the eyes of the doctor were eyes of fire and how cold-hearted he was, and how he introduced some tweezers, searching for the baby. And he found the leg of my baby, and the first thing he did was to cut off one of his legs. And I saw that in the Book of Life, and I heard the scream of my child, and he screamed so loud, that all humanity trembled, all creation trembled, and our Lord Jesus cried. He is there, He is alive, and He is present. Our Lord Jesus is there, alive and present, and He cried. How my baby was slaughtered, and for that reason I was never able to sleep again. 
Of course, how could I, after that human sacrifice? So our Lord showed me what I did not see. The Lord showed me that for every child that a person kills in abortion, the devil uses that innocent blood and he releases from the depths of hell demons of apostasy, demons of satanism, demons of homosexualism, lesbianism, demons that would make people not to believe anymore in God, not to love God, and to be enslaved by their instincts. The devil has made women beasts, and how the enemy goes around the world telling all the people that they have the right to be happy that they should enjoy their sexuality. So he has convinced us that humans are just a pair of genitals and that we have come to enjoy our genitals and that's it. And that if a person doesn't please you, then go look for another one and another one and another one. And that's because he has made us beast and he has made us slaves of our instincts. And why? because he needs human sacrifice. He gets a lot of power for every single child that is sacrificed to him. So now the majority of people say that the devil doesn't exist and that hell does not exist. Before I would say that that was just an invention of the priests. So I killed my child and I died. How terrible that is. Furthermore, I would feel so terrible with myself, so guilty, but I never wanted to go to confession so that God would forgive me because regardless of that horrible sin, such abominable sin, God still forgives it. I poisoned myself with that pain, with that pain that I had every day, with that great pain of having killed my baby. Do you know another thing that's very sad, brothers and sisters? And that's the fact that sin makes your mind sick. It sickens the interior. Your interior starts degrading in such a way that I became a woman who defended women's rights, that I would defend feminism, the rights of women, and I would tell all women, don't be stupid. If you get married and your husband is unfaithful, then get even with him. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Why do we women have to be the ones that always have to put up with everything? Why do they have to step all over women all the time? And I started defending all of this. I started defending women's rights and liberty so that all women can be promiscuous. I started destroying a lot of marriages. I destroyed many homes. And you know, what was the most impressive thing is that I invited a lot of people. I invited my new friends to be promiscuous. And I loved when they told me how they were unfaithful to their husbands. But I never did something like that. Never, ever. I was my entire life a woman for one man. That man was my boyfriend and became my husband. But nonetheless, I destroyed so many marriages, so many people. I became an excellent advocate of the devil. I would advise all the young people to have a lot of sex and to enjoy life, that nothing would happen. And how I was so cynical to tell them to use contraceptives when the contraceptive itself did not work with me. But I was so cynical that I would tell them, just take care of yourselves. Do you know what the Lord showed me? How many people I killed. How many babies I killed? So when I went to the gynecologist, the gynecologist said to me, 
Look, Gloria. So that you don't have to go and have another abortion. I'm going to put a IUD intra uterine device. And you will never have problems again. Can you imagine what happened when I left the abortion clinic? My breasts were full of milk. And I would cry. Every time I saw a child, I would think, oh, that child is a month old. My child would be like him. Would it be a boy or a girl? That kind of thought always followed me, because that's something that nobody can ever forget. After I had the intrauterine device, I got married with my boyfriend, and he became my husband. But our home was a disaster. It was just a disaster. We got married by the church, but not because we loved God. We did it so that we could be in the newspaper because of the beauty of the celebration of the Catholic Mass. Besides, my parents would have never allowed me to get married if I had not married by the church. But the Lord showed me that when we got married here, two people went into the church, but three persons came out because Jesus became part of our life. He united us and we became one. And that unity cannot be broken by anyone. In the Book of Life, I saw how great the sacraments are and how great is the love of God. But our home was horrible because we did everything backwards. We had premarital relations before getting married. Then we had the abortion. So when we got married, it was horrible. It was horrible what we lived. Because I was a feminist and he was a macho man. So we were in a war to death in our marriage. And do you know about another sad thing? Is that in all my experience with the IUD, I had for six years that intrauterine device. And that's because my marriage was such a disaster that I thought that having more children would save my marriage. So after six years, I go to the doctor so that he would take out the intrauterine device. So I had two more children, one girl and one boy, after six years. But it was very sad for my children because the Lord showed me that my children were born in a golden crib because my husband and I would go out to work to give everything to our children. But my husband was never able to be a father, maybe because of the wound of abortion. Little less me to be a mother because I would leave them. I would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and I would go to the gym until 9 o'clock in the morning. At 9, I would go to work, and then I would get out of work at 5.30 in the afternoon, and I would go to the university, and came out at 10 at night. My husband would spend time drinking with his friends, so I would go with a group of friends, and I would drink, and I would get back home at 11 at night, so our children would never see us. Do you know what the Lord said to me about my children? That they had electronic parents. They had television, computers, and video games. He said that those were the ones who formed my children. And he said to me, your children were orphans of mother and father. You went to work to get some money for your children, but your children never met love. They never knew the love of a mother and the love of a father. They didn't have the presence of a mother or the presence of a father. 
For that same reason, my children will only think about themselves. They will isolate themselves. They will just think about having fun and about enjoying. They would think about video games, but they had no love. And if they didn't have any love, how could they love God? The Lord showed me how my husband and I killed our children. You went to get things for your children, but your children never knew how to love. They never knew love. They never knew the love of a mother, and they never knew the love of a father. The Lord showed me that my husband and I killed our children, both of us, because in the first place we had two children and they didn't save our marriage. And in second place, they grew up in a very impressive loneliness. And do you know what else happened with that intrauterine device? From time to time, I would get these very strong bleedings and I would have blood clots. Every woman knows her period. And we're aware of our period, but I had a lot of bleeding that would not stop, so I had to go to the gynecologist. And the gynecologist would say to me, oh, look, twice. Do you want to know what because the church yelled it out at the whole world the church said it to the whole world so the Lord showed me all the babies that I, from the heart of Jesus I came out of the heart of Jesus and that's the reason why I was submerged in a profound sadness and sorrow and because I never went to confession I never came back to the heart of Jesus so what did God show me in the book of life he showed me that from all ten commandments I broke all ten my relationship with God was money it was prosperity I would come out of mass and I would go to see the fortune teller I would read the horoscopes I would practice mental meditation and transcendental meditation and the devil confused me entirely. So my mind and my intellect were closed. And I would say that I was happy because I would drink and I would dance and I would listen to music. But that's how the devil dumps your senses. So much pain we cause to a God that loves intensely. I was happy until I was 13. And when I sinned, afterwards God showed me how dirty my soul was. It was horrible, and I did not go to confession. In the heart of each priest, there's a wound. That wound is a wound of love to God. They love God so much that they deny themselves a personal life for the love of God and they surrender themselves to God. And from within the love of God and the love of a priest comes the service to all of us, their vocation as priests. And do you know one thing, brothers and sisters? All those abortions, all those abortions are changing humanity, transforming all humanity into the image and the likeness of the beast. It's making us all cursed. We become cursed people. A country that has abortion is a cursed country. And the person who votes yes for abortion is a cursed person. Because when a person votes yes, all those abortions go over you. All the aborted children and God will show those people every child that they've killed with their yes. Likewise, it goes for those who did not vote against it because people think that it's not their problem. The person also becomes cursed because God is life. He's not a God of death. He is life. 
the only people who are not cursed in a country are the children of the mother. What mother? The mother church. Those inside the church who defend life, other than that, the rest are cursed. I did a lot of propaganda in my country. I advised so many people to have an abortion, and I would pay money to support abortion. And of all those abortions, do you know what God sees? God sees the most depraved generation of all centuries. There has never existed a most depraved generation. Since the year 1966, up to our days, woman who is now so intelligent, and I say in quotation marks, such a hard-working woman, such a well-educated woman who competes against men, and she's the head of businesses and companies, and she builds countries, and she is so smart that it's never been in any century of all humanity so much blood not even if we gather all the history of all men before 1966 God has never seen so much death as he's seen nowadays can you imagine how many abortions there are every single second and how many abortions there are in one day so that's what our Lord says every time He sees us. He sees the most horrible construction that all humanity is building. That building is not made with bricks. It is made with all the children who were aborted. And it is thousands and thousands of castles and luxuries that we have for the devil. Because that's a satanic sacrifice, and I don't care the way you want to put it. We have become more peace than the people in the past. Because many years ago, people would criticize the demons. And that's because they did not know Jesus Christ. But now we know Jesus Christ, and we still kill our children. So let me tell you that all those abortions and all the power of the devil has a mission. And that's to destroy all the priests. When I used to say, all those priests are homosexuals. They are perverts. The Lord asked me, with what moral authority you, abortionist woman, became God to judge my anointed ones? He said to me, they are flesh. But the holiness of a priest responds for the community in which I give that gift. You never prayed or fasted for their sanctification. If you would have done that, you would have protected them from the attacks of the enemy. He hates them. And um, what's the reason why the devil hates them? That's because through their hands, the body and blood of Jesus is consecrated. That's the reason why. Because every time there's a Eucharist celebration, heaven and earth start getting closer and closer and one day they are going to be united and all the darkness that's between heaven and earth they are being compacted every time and one day all the darkness will disappear and we're going to free of sin forever and that's going to happen on the second coming of jesus that's why there's no more time left for the devil and the less time he has the more he bestializes humanity Many years ago, men would be saved because of the holiness of women. But nowadays, the devil has taken women to defend abortion. Can you imagine? I was one of the persons who defended abortion, even though I was never able to recuperate from abortion. Can you believe that? And I would advise people to have an abortion when I was entirely destroyed due to abortion. I was carrying the flag for the destruction of all humanity. When you go against a marriage, you go against the whole eternity. And when you live without God, it's a whole eternity without God. And to end up with my testimony, do you want to know something else that the Lord showed me? When I went to confession, do you know what a confessioner is? The devil will tell you not to go to confession with another man 
and he will tell you this because he's not stupid. A confessioner is like a washing machine of souls. The soul is not washed with water and soap. The soul is washed with the blood of Jesus. My soul was full of sins. It had a hideous smell. It was putrid. It was all rotten. So when I went to confession, and I had a lot of sorrow, from the heart of the priest, our Lord Jesus came out. Our Lord Jesus comes out, and it is Jesus who washes the soul. It is Jesus, and he comes out of the one of love that's in the priest. And our Lord Jesus would enter my soul with so much tenderness, with so much love, with an immense love. And for every sin that I confess, he would wash me with his blood. And he would leave my soul as white as snow, very clean, very clean. And I would be at peace, I would be free. It was so wonderful when I went to confession. But afterwards, it was not the same. I started looking at sin outside. Do you want to know what the Lord showed me when there's a priest who is a homosexual or who has raped? This is what he showed me. He said to me, you, humanity, you evil and perverted community, you were the ones who drowned my priest in your abortion. So they tried to submerge them in the most sir. Our Lord Jesus stay there. And he hates that from there, from his heart. very much and that God begs us so much because it doesn't matter if you are a great sinner because even to the last minute of your life God is still begging you so that we would convert so that we would come back to him so that we do not give any fruits of evil but fruits of love can you imagine what happens here the miracle of love happens. You may see the priest, but it's not the priest. It is from the heart of the priest that our Lord Jesus gives us the Eucharist. It is our Lord Jesus, is not a man. It is our Lord Jesus that comes out of the priest's heart. And he is the one who offers himself to the Lord. And he is the one who offers himself to God. And our Lord Jesus was crucified. That takes out his heart and he puts it right there on the pattern. And he of the priest. Their hands are the hands of Jesus. And the hands of our Lord Jesus are the hands of God the Father. And from the hands of God the Father, from there, he calls all the people to come up to have an encounter with Jesus. So, God the Father has come down from heaven. How? Through our Lord Jesus. And through Him, all the angels, the saints, and the Blessed Virgin come down. Heaven comes down to adore God. And the souls in purgatory are also present. Everything. It is a moment of communion. And it is here that we have an encounter with the flesh and the blood of Christ.
the bread that has come down from heaven to have eternal life. Has anyone thought about what it is to eat the flesh of God? The Lord asked me, What treasures do you have? And my hands were empty. And the Lord said, What's the case of having all those apartments or your clinic? So much idolatry for your body. Were you able to bring the dust of a brick over here? And he told me, Everything that you had was a blessing. So much was given to you, so, so much will be questioned to you. I have to give account to the Lord for every grain of rice that I threw away in the trash. He asked me for the hunger in the whole world. He asked me for the poverty of the world. He asked me for all the sick, for all the homeless, for all the people who were kidnapped, for all the children who were raped. He said, if you would have prayed, they wouldn't have raped that child. That young person would have not committed suicide. If you would have been meek and humble to the Holy Spirit, that would have never happened. Can you imagine the pain that I felt because I went through life destroying and destroying the works of the Lord? And the Lord asked me, what did you do with the talents that I gave you? I had forgotten that I had a soul, and I forgot that I had talents or gifts, and I entirely forgot that I was created to fulfill the work of the Lord. The Lord said to me, Your death started when you stopped loving your brothers. For every single word I said, I have to give account to the Lord. Our tongue kills a lot. Every time I made fun of someone, I had to give account to the Lord. Every time I killed a person with my tongue, I had to give account to the Lord. Every time I humiliated someone, I had to give account to the Lord. The Lord showed me the kind of wound that I left in each person that I met, and how sin did not remain in me. But when I fell in the trap of witchcraft, it's so delicious to fall into witchcraft and divination and fortune telling. Can you imagine how terrible this is? When they tell you about your horoscope, when they tell you if you're a Gemini or if you are Sagittarius, or they tell you about the power of the mind, you have no idea how many people I drag into that. I drag my brothers, I drag family members, I drag my patients, and how many people they drag into those things as well. And all that makes people run away from God. The devil puts a candy so that he can throw you into darkness. How many people did I hurt? So much pain, dear brothers and sisters, so much pain. Such a big pain. So when the book of my life closed, do you know how the Lord showed me what marriage is? The Lord showed me that marriage was like a rose plant. I take care of it. I And he said that he was a gardener. And my enemy hates my roses. He hates all marriages. And he looks for many ways to destroy them. If a marriage is founded in me, I am the gardener. And maybe the roses will be shaken, but he will not be able to pull it out. And your children, the children that you have in your marriage, they are like little rosebuds. So I take care of the little rosebuds. But the enemy comes with his storms. He comes with his passions. He comes with dryness. He comes with his wind. And he tries to destroy the little rosebuds. But if I am the gardener, the little roses may lose some petals but the enemy will not be able to destroy any of the little roses. That's our Lord Jesus, a God who loves, a God who wants our salvation, a God who begs. When my book of life closed, 
what a horrible pain when I saw all the consequences of my sins and how many souls I destroyed. It was not just my soul. How many? And my book of life closed and I started asking all the saints to save me. And when I ran out of all the saints and I saw there was nothing else to do for me, I looked up and I saw the eyes of my mom, my mother who tried to take me to the ways of the Lord. And I would say about her that she was crazy, that she was old fashioned, that she was the mother of Peter Flintstone, that I hated my mother, my own mother. My mother lifts up both of her fingers and she pointed out something. I do not remember what I saw, but the scabs that I had on my eyes fell down. My spiritual blindness. And at that moment I saw a beautiful moment in my life when a patient said to me, Doctor, you are a very materialistic woman and you think that the power of the world and the money will get you anything. But that's a lie. One day you will need this. The day in which you are in a very imminent danger. It doesn't matter what kind of danger it is. Ask our Lord Jesus to cover you with his blood because he will never ever abandon you because he has paid a price of blood for you. And with that pain, I claim to the Lord, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, Lord. Forgive me. Give me a second chance. And that was the most beautiful moment because he comes down in that light and he takes me out of that pit. He places me outside in a flat surface. You are going to return. And who have cried for you. Do you know what else I saw? I saw the great power of the prayer of intercession. on her left hand. Their prayers were like a little flame. And on her right hand, she picked up all the prayers from all the saints in heaven. And she interceded for me. But do you know who was the reason why I'm here? I am here due to the poorest of all the people in Colombia. It was a very poor farmer who was an illiterate person and who lived in the Sierra Nevada in Santa Marta. His crop was burned. He didn't have anything to eat. He was suffering because the rebels from the guerrilla were asking him for his oldest child. The guerrilla in my country they take the children from the farmers, children who are nine years old, and they teach them how to kill. If the farmer doesn't have anything to pay, tribute, they take away their children so that they become killers. So they were asking this farmer, his son, and on Sunday he came down from the Sierra and he walked a long way with his wife and his two children. Where were they walking to? They were going to Mass. When he finally arrived to this humble place where they celebrated Mass, as soon as he entered this place, he put his forehead on the dirt and he said inside, Lord, I love you. And he started saying to the Lord, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the life. Thank you for our health. 
thank you for your love. I never thank the Lord. And he started saying to the Lord, Lord, I ask you for Colombia so that Colombia becomes good, so that it will convert, so that it will love you. I ask you that the entire world becomes good, that the entire world loves you, that the entire world looks for you, oh Lord. So when the farmer came out of the church after Mass, he bought panela. The panela was wrapped up in a newspaper called the spectator. The panela is like a candy that's made out of cane sugar. And in the center of that newspaper was a picture of me taking where I was burned. When he looked at the picture, he was so moved and he started crying and he didn't know how to read and he read the news with a lot of difficulty. When he read the news, he prostrated himself on the ground and he says the prayer that brought me here and he said, Dear Lord, have mercy of oh, my little sister. Dear Lord, please save her. Dear Lord, if you save my little sister, I promise you that I'll go to the sanctuary in Buga and I'll pay you for a promise. But please save my little sister. Can you imagine, dear brothers and sisters, that poor farmer? He didn't have anything to eat, but he promised the Lord to go across the country just for me. He said to God, Dear Father, and he called me his little sister. He made the heart of the Lord tremble, and it is thanks to him that I am here with you today. And the Lord pointed towards him and he said, And that's to love thy neighbor. And that's when the Lord gives me a mission. It's a mission that I've been doing for 11 years now. And I've been going through many different countries in the world. 11 years. I've been in congresses with up to 10,000 people present. I've been in places where there's been a thousand or a hundred people. I don't know. I never look at the numbers because I don't know what the Lord is going to do when I go to a place. I only go to share the gift that the Lord gave me because that's a mission. And he said to me, this, you are not going to repeat it a thousand times, but you will repeat it a thousand times, a thousand. And woe for those who haven't heard you to not change, because they will be judged with much more severity, just as you are going to be judged on your second return. My anointed ones or any other people because there's not a worse dead person than the one who does not want to listen, nor a worse blind person than the one who does not want to see. And let me tell you one thing, dear brothers and sisters. This is not a threat. Do you want to know what this is? This is a God in love, a God who loves, a God who searches, a God who begs you, so he gave me a second chance. And it is also the second chance for all of you, dear brothers and sisters. He is lending you a mirror, which is my life. My husband was 49 years old and he never suffered from anything. Four months ago, in the morning he was fine, and by the afternoon he was dead. He died. That's a reality. That's the reality that we have. But I have a lot of peace because I know that my husband is enjoying in the love of Jesus. He converted. 
he confessed. He started searching for God, a God of love. He started to receive Holy Communion. And after his experience with the love of God, he stopped being an alcoholic. He stopped smoking. And he started to have a lot of love for his children. It was so much love that when I had to go to many different places around the world, he would stay home and take care of our children, his little children. How beautiful it is to have peace in our hearts when we know that Jesus is there in the Holy Eucharist. I'll tell you, dear brothers and sisters, the only thing that we have for sure is death. And in any moment we can be before the Lord, giving account for our sins. A life without God is an eternity without God. Forget about the devil and everything else. That's nothing compared to this. There's no greater torment than to lose the love of God. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He wants you in heaven. That's why he paid with his own life, shedding the last drop of his blood, because he loves us. We were not created for hatred, for evil, for selfishness. We have come to love God. May God bless you all. You can count on my prayers, and I pray for all the people who listen to this testimony. And I trust in the Lord that you and myself would make our way to conversion and to come back to the heart of the Lord, back to the heart of Jesus. We'll see each other in heaven. May God bless you all. All the apostles are for the Lord. All the glory be to the Lord.